Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for letting it was a weird, you know, it's like, my wife's going to come up at the end of the sermon and straighten it out and line it up and make it make sense. That's what she told me anyway. No, no, she didn't. Um, hey, let me, uh, I have issues, and I just want you to know that up front so that you don't, like, get your hopes too high on how things are, might, might go here. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, being able to come here and uh, and... And I appreciate to be here uh, and feel the presence of God and to see the love that's going on in the, in the Jesus moments. I, I mean, I just had this in between times and had this great talk with your pastor uh, and my head kind of exploded. Does that happen to you when your pastor talks to you? Just kind of like. <laughs> so good luck with the rest of this day, huh? Um, I was a kid, uh, I was a seventh out of seven kids. When I showed up, my mom was 45 when I was born. And I was uh, hampered quite a bit by over care. <laughs> when I got married, my wife told me that she wasn't my mother. And I had to learn that. Because I was raised in a family where I wanted this shoe tied. I'd lift it up like this, and they'd tie that shoe. I'd lift it up here, they'd tie that shoe, and they'd give me a coat, and I'd go out the door. Uh, my mom had seven kids, and so she had all these big meals. And so I was the last one at home when we, we retired, moved to Albany, Oregon. And, and so she, was, she would come in in the morning and take my order for breakfast. What would I like? So now when I got married and I got sick... My wife would say things like, I hate it when you're sick. <laughs> when are you going to get well? And I was thinking maybe she would bring me some soup or, you know. No, she's not my mother. So Mother's Day is not her day for me. It's her. She's the mother of my children, and she's an amazing mom. Uh, I, so school was across the street, little one-room school, and I would for. It was cold in the morning, so I'd wear a coat. I'd go over to school. School be it would warm up at the end of the day. This is in north central Montana, where spring is kind of like snows once in a while, and so we'd have a coat in the morning. But by the end of the day, I would take my coat off and leave it in the school, and then they'd lock the school, and it was too warm, and I'd go home, and then the next morning I'd have to have a coat. So I'd get another coat and then another coat. Pretty soon I was using my sister's coats, whoever's coats. And I'd go to school. And finally the teacher gathered up this big pile of laundry and confronted me in the classroom and said, you would forget your head if it wasn't attached. And threw my stuff there in front of me. Well, something, something took hold there. And I'm not like blaming my teacher, like, oh, no. But... I was branded and identified as the guy who can't remember anything. That's what happens. I have issues. I told you. There's more coming. I want to share with you out of the book of Ruth for a minute. Ruth is a story of Ruth and Orpah who were daughters-in-law of Naomi. Naomi... And Amalek, that's her husband, he was identified in, in a, it just said he died. I hope I get known for more than that. <laughs> but Naomi's husband died, and then 10 years later, her sons died. And so she had these two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Na uh, Ruth. And Naomi was going back because she was starving to death, and she was going back to Judah where they, she, they heard that God had blessed and there was food. So she was going back, and she told her daughter-in-law, she said, hey, listen, you're my daughter's in law. Why don't you go back to your own people? Go back to the gods that you worshiped and the cultures you're from. You don't have to follow me back to, to Bethlehem. You can just stay and go back with your people. Orpah said, okay. And so she leaves, but... Ruth, it says she clung to her in verse 14 of Ruth 1. She clung to her and wept out loud. And I, she didn't want to, 
And then you find these famous words. Let's just read Ruth 1, verse 15. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. This is a serious commitment, folks. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Okay, see, this is, I want to share with you a little bit, a little bit about living beyond the law. See, there, were, there was a, a legal, bow, uh, she was legally bound as daughters-in-law, but then her sons died, so she was free. She, she gave them the freedom, but Ruth said, no, I'm, I'm with you. It's beyond the legal requirement, but I am, I am with you. Uh, even though uh, Naomi's husband died and her sons died, she had, and they were traveling, and they're, they're like known as the widows now, I guess, because all their husbands died. Why is it men don't last as long as women? Did you notice that? Sometimes we, there's a few of them that stick out, but... I mean, I look like I'm 80, and my wife looks like she's 40, So this, and we're the same age. But. Okay. Uh, but Ruth clung to her, and she wanted the relationship that was beyond the law. And can I just tell you that that's what Jesus is after with us, that we would get beyond the law and get past the requirement thing and get into a relationship of depth with with her living beyond the law and and understanding that the law is good it's a good start i mean i mean we talk about tithing there's a 10% it's a, it's a legal thing and but god want, doesn't want 10% he wants all of your stuff he doesn't want to just kind of have a portion of you he wants all of you and that's this is how it is i i done weddings, and I know your pastor hates them, but I, I do them, um, so if you can't get him to do it, I will do it for like 75 bucks. I'll come over. <laughs> Did I undercut you there? Is it 80? No. Uh, weddings are weird, though. I just got to tell you. Uh, if you're just getting married, they're not weird for you, of course, but they're there's sometimes, uh, and I prefer funerals. <laughs> this is where I shouldn't go. But funerals are different. People are, what can I do to help? There's some more chairs. I get more chairs. The food is an enormous amount of food. You go do a wedding, the caterer didn't make enough food. There's not enough food. There's not enough chairs. The lighting is wrong. It's like, funerals, it's like, Somebody died, so we're just like, nothing else matters. Let's talk about this person and what God is doing here. Whoa, maybe that's what Jesus wants in us, to have this level of commitment to him that's beyond the law and just the little stuff that doesn't matter goes away, and we're, that is not in my notes. <laughs> you can run the tape back if you need to. This is living. I do weddings, and so I stand up, and I, I, I have this little awkward moment in a wedding for me where I say that it is by the authority invested in me, by the state of Oregon, to pronounce it your husband and wife. It's like, eh. The state of Oregon is not going to hold your marriage together. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> it may try to tear it apart. So I kind of like the state of Oregon and God. That's the authority that matters. Because when you're married, you're not married under the law. When you're married in God, you're, you're married under the power and the anointing and the, the presence of God. You're all in with each other. This grace thing isn't less. It's more. It's complete. I, I, I talked to the, I did this. I just mentioned it to the groom, I said, all your stuff now becomes her stuff, and all her stuff becomes your stuff. And I just casually, your, your 1958 yellow Ford pickup is now hers. And he just got, whew. 
You mean I don't just like give half of it? No. All of it. See, this is, this is where Ruth was with Naomi. It's like, I know I'm not really your daughter-in-law anymore. I'm free from the law, but I am with you. I am 100% committed to you. And I want to live beyond the law. I want to live to the place where, where it's... It's to love deeply, okay? It's to, it's to take a place where, where you're, you just love them. Um, so these girls are coming back. Naomi and Ruth are coming back. And they're widows. They're known for widows. See, the issues of your life will begin to define you. And just like when I forgot my coat... They started to define me, and I kind of took it on. I still can't find anything, but I know if you leave your keys in the car, you'll always know where they're at. <laughs> they don't like that in the valley. So Dad had 10 uh, Black Angus registered heifers. And he was proud of them, paid a lot of money for them. And then every, every spring, we take the cattle and move them up before farming starts and move them up to the reservation near Browning, Montana. And there's great grass up there and great mountains and great big grizzly bears and things like that. And so you lose a few. That's part of the lease. That there's a few of them that won't come home. Uh, but... We had those cattle rustled, and they were gone. The, they knew the good ones because they took all the good ones. And we were out living in Albany, Oregon now, and Dad had, had, had actually had just passed away, and we got a check in the mail from the Great Falls Auction Yard, uh, and it was a check for $630. Uh, they had run an old cow through that they found a brand that was Lazy B Bar B, and it was Dad's brand, and so, well, it's... Dad's cow, so they sent him a check. Or us. See, brands last a long time for a reason. It's because they're identifying. They're marks of ownership. They're marks of identity. And if you're not careful, the enemy wants to brand you and establish you in a place. Establish a, a situation in you, an issue of your life. Just like Ruth and Naomi are traveling back. They're known as the widows. And I want to just share with you that just because uh, that you're, you've had something happen in your life does not define you. God wants to define you. Um, and you have to love in a place that's deeper than the law. It's an all-in kind of deal. It's, it's kind of like church membership. Thank you for coming today. If you accidentally stumbled into this building in this church, we've got this little rule that you're a member now. <laughs> you're in. <laughs> it's not that we don't have membership. You have membership. You're here. You're part. I've seen you hugging each other. You're members. I know that you love each other. You're members. You do anything for each other. You're members of the body. Because if I have a membership card, legally documented, and it's in your signature, it says that you're a membership. Lila and I started attending this little dysfunctional church in north central Montana when we first came out of Bible school. And they said, we want you to be a member. And we said, eh, I don't know. What, what, is, what do I do? And so I said, fill out this card. And on this card was like no bowling, no going to movies, <laughs> all the things we currently love. And, and you know... Uh, no questionable amusements. Hmm. I don't know what that is, but it sounds more interesting now that you brought it up. So I, had, you know, we had all these things on the card, and I said to the pastor, "I said I'm not sure I can sign this thing." And he goes, "Oh, just cross out what you don't agree with and sign it." <laughs> they were pretty desperate for members, so we did that. I mean, it was like. What's the word? Redacted? We, we redacted uh, the membership cards. Little, pat, handed them back this little card with all these black lines in it. And uh, so then we were in. 
See, here's the deal. If I have your signature or if your pastor has your signature on a card but doesn't have your heart, he's got nothing. But if we have your heart, we don't need no stinking little piece of paper. I mean, I, I understand there's a place for commitments and all that stuff. And there's weddings. You know, you do weddings and you sign the documents. Except one time I forgot to turn it into the courthouse. There's that forgetful thing again. Seven years later, they tried to buy a house and they said, I'm sorry, you're not married. It's my niece. She calls me, Uncle Joe. We've been living in sin for seven years. I think they might have been, but anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So the lady at the courthouse just crossed it out and said, ah, we'll just backdate it. <laughs> because if I stand up and I say by the state authority of the state of Oregon, you know, what is that? Can I just tell you, God wants to operate in your life in an authority that is beyond anything legal. It goes, it trans, it's spiritual. It's life-giving. The, the spirit gives life. The law kills. If you try to achieve a certain thing because you're in a legal situation, you, that's no fun at all. But if you are all in with somebody, you have a life together. I don't look at my wife and, and say, because I'm sworn by my duties 40 years ago in front of the church, I'm going to now make you breakfast in the morning. Oh, I was like, if I can, this girl is amazing. If I make her breakfast, she just likes, it's the way to her heart, it's through her stomach. So, <laughs> because I love her. It's not a legal deal. See, Jesus came and he wants us to transcend all that stuff. And get to the heart of the deal and live where we need to live. So Jesus was walking from, well, he had been doing miracles. And the throngs of people were just burying him. And he, he gets out of the bow, he crosses, and there's people again. And they're just pushing in and touching him. And uh, Jarius, this is in Mark chapter 5. Jarius comes, he's a leader of the synagogue, and he falls down at Jesus' feet. This is a religious dude with lots of, with lots of pride and, and, and prestige, but he had lost it all. His little girl was dying, his little daughter was on her deathbed, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and said, I need you to come and heal her. And, and Jesus said, your faith is going, this is going to work. You're all in here. I'm going to come and heal your daughter. So Jesus starts going there and to heal this little girl. And the crowd is pressing and touching him. And, and all of a sudden, on his way, he has stopped. And he stops his tracks and he wheels around and says, who touched me? Somebody touched me. And, and the, the, I guess the, the popular... Word would be the disciples who go, duh, everybody's touching you. They're, everybody's pressing in on you. They're, Lord, who touched you? No, Jesus said, I felt virtue flow out of my body. And I, I felt, I don't know what that was, but it was the life of God that, that you and I experienced from time to time when we were having the presence of the Lord wash over us. It was like, Phew! And it went into this woman and healed her who had this issue of blood. The King James called it. She had an issue for 12 years. She was known as the woman who had this issue because they had to set her outside. and She couldn't be a part of things. There was something wrong with this woman. And she had been a, a woman of, of, of notoriety and, stand, and standing in the community. But she had this issue and it was taking her out and taking her down. 12 years she was dealing with this. And so when they see her and the community sees her, they don't look at her as, oh, this is that great. No, this is the woman with that issue. If you haven't experienced that, you probably will. There are issues in your life that people will look at you and say, oh, that's, that's who you are. Uh, Brandon, you. That's who you become. Until Jesus is touched by you. You have to touch Jesus. And it's not just a casual 
legal, documented experience. It's an all-in commitment to the Lord where you're saying, I, you, you're like Jarius, the, the synagogue leader. He threw himself down at the feet of Jesus. I, I need you, God. I need you. I need all of you. And Jesus brings healing and wholeness to a level that, that brings a change now. That this woman, I don't know, it doesn't go on and say what she's known for, but I, I, she's going to be known for the woman who is healed. So many times we come to the Lord and we've got issues in our life and we start our experience in church by begging God for forgiveness again. Like, oh God, I'm so sorry, I just did it. How many have fights on the way to church? You know, that happens. Dad used to go out in the car and just honk. I had four sisters. <sighs> Easter was just a nightmare. And, and they'd get in a perfume, and we're all in this one big station wagon. It's just like my eyes are watering. It's like <laughs> Dad would just go out in the car and honk. <clears throat> well, so you get to church, and then you got to, you know, Worship the Lord. <laughs> Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And so you find yourself maybe having life as messy as it is, and then you come into the place where you have to worship the Lord, and you, you remember the verse from Sunday school class, hey, don't bring your worship before God until you've taken care of all this stuff in your life. You've got to go out. You can't have unforgiveness. Okay. Okay, God, forgive me this, forgive me that. Let's see, anything else I can think of? Okay, I think I'm clean. All right. I, want to, I just want to tell you a word from the Lord for you for this moment. And this probably is why I'm speaking today and nothing else, really. We sometimes pursue forgiveness. And we forget to press in and pursue healing. Forgiveness is going to be celebrated when we have communion together here in a minute. But there is a work of healing. The Lord let me know this. I was dealing with my issues. And I was like, God, I can't. I got I to gotta preach. I got to worship. And it's like the Lord says, well, it's not forgiveness. If forgiveness has been given you. It's just like before you ask, <laughs> it's gone. What you need is healing. And for healing to take place, you need to touch me. And you need to press in past the, the crowd. And you need to get to the place where I have to touch Jesus. And have that virtue that flows from him into me. So my mom and dad were married in, uh, I don't know what year. When you have old parents, and then you get old, I mean, they came from the Great Depression. Dad and his, there were nine siblings. Their mom and dad had a farm in North Dakota where they escaped during the Great, the, not the Tribulation. The, <laughs> it felt like a Great Tribulation. It was the Great Depression, which is a lot like the Great Tribulation, only drier. <laughs> I don't know. But their dad passed away, and then their mother married the hand, the, how, the hired man. It's kind of what you do. It's kind of like Naomi and Ruth. Wow, he died. You can find somebody. So they married him, and that wasn't so good. They had some more kids. But then not only did the hired man die, then the mom died. So he had 22 years old, all the way down to five years old, these nine children traveling from North Dakota to Montana, and they started. And my dad got saved at a... At a at a revival, and he, he met my mom at church, but she had a child. My oldest sister, Janie, lives in Redmond. She's a missionary in the Philippines and in Tonga. Amazing woman, writes, wrote an amazing book called A Place to Belong. Talks about the story, but, but mom was viewed as tainted goods by the rest of the siblings that my dad was farming with, and they pushed her aside because she was tainted goods. I didn't even know that 
my sister wasn't my sister full. Well, she was, but she wasn't. I didn't know about this sordid past until mom and dad had their 25th anniversary and my sister Janie was 33. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm not the smartest guy, but I wonder if even I'm one of the part of this family. <laughs> Let me tell you what had happened. My mom and dad had so seamlessly embraced the work of God. The branding wasn't there. The stigma wasn't there. The issues of life that were in the past were now absorbed and dominated by the power and the presence of Jesus in our lives. That's where God wants us to live. Not in some kind of perpetual state of apologizing to God, apologizing to God. No, get healed. Get your healing. Get that issue resolved and let Jesus have it. Let him, you have to touch him though. It's not something that's just casual. It's a, it's a commitment you make to him and he brings that life into your life. Oh. This woman had an issue. But God healed it and it wasn't the issue that defined her. Come on, Lila. Make sense of this. I don't want to ruin it. Um, I, um, hi, good morning. <laughs> um, I ha- I've just been praying before we um, came and everything, and I just want to talk to you as a mama a little bit. At times, I not only have dealt with my issues and been branded by my issues, but I've been branded by my children's issues. And I have defined myself by what, how they're doing or how they're not doing or whatever. And um, God wants to heal that as well in you moms. He wants to lift off guilt and shame. He wants to lift off condemnation. And you can say that better than I can. But um, he wants to lift that off. And he wants to make you free. And the thing that you can do for your children is to pray for them. Do you know that you mamas are the most anointed, you mom and dads are the most anointed to pray for your children. You've been set apart to pray for your kids and for their future and for what they're going through now. And don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that you're defined by their issues and you're not free of yours because you can be free of both. And so I just want to encourage you in that. And I'd like to pray over you if I could. Lord Jesus, um, we are so grateful for your love and your forgiveness and your healing, Lord Jesus. And I pray that any of us that are defined by our issues or by someone else's, I pray in the name of Jesus, you'll bring healing. And I pray that you'll bring joy and peace to us in your name. You are so faithful and you are so good. And we praise you. Amen.